Hello, welcome to Layers with Larry. I'm Larry, and these are all my layers. Today we're going to, uh, to move way to the top, up the top layers of, of the layers of rocks here in the Bighorn Basin area around Cody. Um, we're going to focus on rocks of the Cenozoic period. Uh, so far we've talked in past videos about the Precambrian, um, We've also got videos uh, in the uh, Paleozoic, which are coming up soon, um, or you may have already seen them. And uh, we've already covered some of the Mesozoic. What we haven't really got into is the Cenozoic. For us, fortunately, that's relatively simple because unlike a lo lot of places on Earth that have the whole Cenozoic exposed in various places, we only have the first part of it, but I think it's the most interesting part. Um, if, uh, looking at the top of the layers uh, in the Bighorn Basin, the very top is marked as the Absarca Volcanics. And they are the youngest rocks in the Bighorn Basin area, They're mostly to the west of the basin, however. Um, but they're not sedimentary rocks. So, in fact, the youngest sedimentary rocks uh, exposed in the Bighorn Basin area are the Fort Union Formation of Paleocene Age, which is roughly about 60 million years ago or so. And uh, the rocks that formed on top of them, called the Willwood Formation of Eocene time, early Eocene time. Uh, and then after that, we don't have any deposition in the Bighorn Basin. Um, little geology first. Uh, you know, the rocks that we see around Cody, often the ones that are tilted, like in the, in the canyon, in Shoshone Canyon, they were tilted during the formation of the Rocky Mountains. And uh, that happened not just uniformly, like the land just didn't all rise up at the same time in the same way in the same places. It was highly variable. Uh, in this area, the rocks that we have along the west side of the Bighorn Basin were thrust up. The rocks on the east side of the Bighorn Basin, Bighorn Mountains, for example, and the Priors were thrust up. And down in the south, uh, down towards Thermopolis, there are mountains there. And in the north, it's not as obvious, but there was quite a bit of uplift there as well. So it kind of made like a, almost like a semicircular ring of uplift all around the area we called the basin, uh, which made it into a kind of a basin. If you had a flat area, but the, uh, the edges were all thrust up, they'd be like a big mound all the way around in a big circle. Well, what was in the middle would be left behind and it would be at a low point. Um, so as soon as the Rocky Mountains began to form, they began to erode away. The Rocky Mountains used to be as much as like 30,000 feet high, like the Himalayas. But the Himalayas are still high like that because they're still being pushed up faster than they're being eroded down. Once the Rockies mostly formed, after about 65 million years ago or so, the process of erosion had been going on for quite some time, and all those high points all around what we call the Bighorn Basin now eroded material down into that basin. The first part of that material to erode down into it is the Fort Union Formation. Because it was the first part, it often came down slopes, and a lot of times uh, the Fort Union Formation is a little bit sloped, but not as much as the rocks that were pushed up by the Rocky Mountains. Um, that filled out the basin quite a bit. And it was a very calm place with lots of lakes and swamps. Uh, and so it enabled uh, plants that grew in that area. It was actually a subtropical sort of environment at that time to leave behind lots of remains of themselves. And it formed the coal beds, which we see, by the way, over in Gillette. Um, those are the Fort Union formation as well. And we have uh, coal uh, formations here in the Bighorn Basin. Uh, the ones in the Fort Union include the ones like when you drive up towards Red Lodge and you, before you get to, uh, to Bear Creek, uh, there's that big old coal mine, abandoned one there. That's in the Fort Union formation. In addition to the coal, which is the compressed remains of plants, often in the layers above and below, in sandy or muddy layers like this, you find um, traces of the fossil plants that were around at that time. And they are the kinds of things that would live today in places like, uh, well, like Florida, subtropical kinds of plants. Even things like ferns and palms and stuff like that. Um, as, I, as time went on, um, the basin started to fill, and as it filled up, the new layers that came in were laid down pretty horizontally. You've all probably seen the Badlands area when you drive towards Grey Bull or you head up towards uh, uh, Montana, and sometimes you see those sort of low hilly areas, uh, sometimes typified by alternating bands of like sort of reddish rock and grayish rock, reddish rock, grayish rock, 
uh, and they are the remnants of these floodplains. Um, when floods came down in the rivers and carried lots of sediment and dumped them all over the land, those are the gray layers. The red layers are layers of, uh, or, or soils of the subtropical rainforest that persisted for a very, very long time and were exposed to oxygen for a long time. So that's why they turned kind of reddish. They're called paleosols. And we find uh, when we go and look at these rocks and we look at the layers of just on the top of the red layers between the red and the gray, we often find bits of uh, early creatures, vertebrates, mammals that were developing during this time. After the dinosaurs became extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period about 65 million years ago, then about 50 or 60 percent of all kinds of life on Earth became extinct at that time. Subject for another video. But that opened up the world to any creature that could survive that extinction. And mammals were one of those creatures. And birds, by the way. And I said dinosaurs were extinct. That was kind of wrong, wasn't it? Because it was the non-avian dinosaurs that became extinct. The avian dinosaurs are still with us today. <laughs> They're called the birds. Uh, so they had a great opportunity to develop. And all of the major types of mammals that we think of today, things like bats, uh, things like horses, uh, camel type things, rhinoceri type, type things, horses, all that kind of stuff, all appear here in the Bighorn Basin uh, and in some other parts of the world because the Pangaea had broken up a little before this time, um, but continents were still pretty close together and a lot of the life forms on the different continents were, were, were similar and evolved in similar directions. So, so why in the Eocene was it so warm and wet in what we call Wyoming today? Was it because we were closer to the equator? No. Uh, when we do careful studies of plate tectonics, in fact, Wyoming is pretty much at the same latitude or the distance from the equator uh, now as we were then. Uh, but worldwide temperatures, and this largely has to do mostly with volcanism that happened during the Eocene time. Again, that'll be part of another video more, but volcanoes put lots and lots of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and you know a little bit about the greenhouse effect and that's probably one of the things that caused that also changes in in ocean currents as a result of the continents all sort of moving away from each other and moving around but anyway the, the global temperatures were on average about nine degrees warmer um, than they are now so imagine Wyoming nine degrees warmer on average uh, it's subtropical it, it's uh, you know you've got plants that are um, adapted to that kind of a warm, wet, lush environment. Uh, lots of plant life and growth because of the warmth and the, and the, and the nutrients and the water. Very different than today. Uh, even though grasses existed during that time, they didn't exist much here. Grasses are adapted to a cooler, drier climate. Um, more on that later. So what kinds of creatures are we talking about? Um, some of you have this book. I've mentioned it before in the, uh, in the videos. Uh, on pages uh, 62 and 63, if you happen to have a copy of it, take a quick look because it talks about the lower tertiary period, which is what I'm talking about right now, that Paleocene and Eocene time. And it shows a great little sort of drawing of the plants and the animals that typified um, that particular environment. Uh, um, so you, you have uh, uh, huge uh, fishes plying through the rivers and lakes. Here, for example, is... Uh, uh, the scales and one vertebra of an alligator gar that was common during this time. Uh, based on the size of that vertebra, uh, we're talking about an alligator gar that's like 300 pounds and probably seven feet long. Wow. Fish on. <laughs> and, and also in those w bodies of water, you had crocodilians. Uh, this is a, a vertebra from a, um, a crocodilian type creature. It um, was not, didn't have sharp teeth though. He was plying the uh, lakes and the rivers looking for uh, shellfish. Uh, there were lots of freshwater mussels at that time. They even left behind pearls, fossil pearls. I haven't found one yet, but it'd be nice to find one. Um, these little guys, and you know, rounded teeth, they're not sharp. They're designed for crushing mollusks. This is a piece of Willwood formation. Um, you can see these white bits are actually bits of shell. They're all crushed up maybe by a clam-crushing crocodilian. Um, and uh, when a lot of these mammals died, their bodies laid on the surface for a long time. Um, their bodies would get broken up into bits and pieces. Animals would, would 
uh, you know, harvest uh, some minerals from them. Rodents, for example, just like they do today, will, like they do on um, deer and elk antlers, will gnaw at the, um, those materials because they're rich in calcium and other minerals, sometimes on the, the bones of these 50 million year old mammals, we actually find little rodent gnawings on the fossil bone. So that's pretty cool. Well, this particular piece is neat because it's a mudstone, it's clearly you know, deposited in water, but an animal died in this area and part of its body was laying underneath that because when this got broken open, you could clearly see the jaw, the lower jaw of a creature called Phenacotus. Their teeth are not grazing type teeth. Those really didn't develop until later when grasses became more common, like 20 million years later. So most of all these creatures that we're gonna look at, you'll see their teeth are designed for browsing on the low hanging vegetation, leaves, you know, regular type leaves, not, not grasses. Um, he was probably kind of a omnivore, probably could eat plants certainly, but he might have also uh, uh, consumed uh, animal flesh. These are parts of a creature called Corypidon. Corypidon um, it's kind of like almost like a hippopotamus looking thing. He didn't leave behind any definite known and or descendants. Uh, he had really bizarre teeth uh, in the front of his mouth. He had really big sharp canine teeth like you think like he maybe he was like a saber-toothed cat sort of a thing. But then he has other teeth are, are designed for browsing and grazing and grinding up plant material. So uh, mostly it's probably an herb herbivore. Even uh, hippopotamus teeth even have these sort of structures to them and, and they primarily just eat plants. Uh, here's a part of a vertebra and part of a toe bone of this guy. They got to be about eight feet long. They were kind of the monster of, uh, of the Willwood formation. Most of the mammals were relatively small. Um, in this case is a, a little bit of a jaw. Uh, this is part of a hyracotherium, uh, which is a little ancestral horse, not much bigger than a fox. And it didn't walk on one little toe like modern day horses. It walked on quite a few little toes. And it didn't have teeth adapted for grazing because he wasn't grazing. There was no really any grass around for him to eat, even if he wanted to. So he's a browser eating low hanging branches um, of, uh, of subtropical plants. So in mentioning what, what a lot of these mammals ate, um, you know, here's a good example. These are. Um, alders and some other, there's like 10 or 12 different species of uh, hardwoods um, that were available, you know, producing leaves for these guys to eat. Uh, the trees at the time were varied. Uh, these are both um, replaced by silica. Um, look at a previous video we did about the form, how fossil wood is formed, if, you're, if you would like to refresh your memory on that. Uh, they show features even as detailed as the knot of a tree where a branch came out. In this case, uh, you can probably see how this was a branch right here as it was preserved. No wood left, of course. It's all replaced by silica. Um, these are um, belong to a, a type of conifer called a meta sequoia. Uh, if you know the term sequoia from having to do with redwoods, you're right. They, they still live today in parts of the world. These were kind of special uh, conifers in a way. We think of them as evergreens, right? They, they don't lose their, their needles um, during the year. They keep them all year round. These guys actually did lose their needles every year. They were a, a deciduous conifer. It's a, a non-evergreen evergreen. That's kind of weird to think about. And this last little thing, if, um, this one looks very different than what you normally think of as wood, and that's because it's a, um, a fossil palm, uh, part of a palm tree. They're really not trees in the sense that these guys are. Um, the parts of these plants that, that conduct water and minerals from the roots up and the nutrients from the leaves down. Uh, in the case of modern trees, that all happens just under the bark and all the inside wood is dead. But in a palm tree, those tubes that run up and down the plant actually run all through the plant. So in cross section, they kind of have this little, uh, this little detailed sort of structure. Very strange. So in th this case, um, I've assembled uh, some interesting examples of, of different things. I'll show you a close-up of that. You'll notice that there's numbers on, on all these things. Uh, the ones up at the top, numbers one, two, and three, are all parts of the early horse, the hyracotherium. Uh, two lower jaw bits on the right and the left, and in the middle is part of the maxilla, or the upper jaw. Uh, this one down here, mark number four, is uh, again that phenacotus um, guy. He's um, um, you know, smaller than the corypidon, 
but, uh, but much bigger than the horse. There's also this uh, example of this guy here. It's called a creodont, number five. It has a carnivore-looking teeth, and that's tooth because that's what he was. It was a carnivore. So we've got herbivores, we've got carnivores, the whole gamut. Uh, these little round white things, number 13, are actually seeds, um, the hard inner parts of a seed of a plant called the hackberry tree, which still survives today. So we're getting close enough in time to the present where a lot of the creatures that are that were found in, in things of this time period um, actually have an unbroken um, record of descendants from, from their start. Uh, way down here at the bottom on the uh, right is number 19, and that's that uh, clam-crushing crocodilian guy. Next to that, number 18 is a bit of a turtle shell, turtle scoot. Number 16 is particularly important in terms of humans because uh, that's one of the lemurs or one of the primates. There are about nine different primates uh, that existed at this time. Yeah. And we're primates, of course. Here are some freshwater snails, mark number 12. And a little more of the garfish um, scales. Incisor tooth from a Corypidon, number seven. So in conclusion, it's, uh, it's hard to imagine Wyoming looking like Louisiana Swamp or, or a Florida Everglades, but, but that's what we had right here. Uh, in the case of over in Gillette, we have these thick, thick coal beds because there the swamps were persistent for a long, long time and there was no sediment coming in. All there was was plant material. And as the plant material developed, the land actually was sinking. It sank at the same rate that the plant material was, was forming in it. So that's why we've got these really thick coal beds there. We don't have those other places. Um, but a rich, uh, rich in life, plants, animals of all kinds. Um, you know, the Bighorn Basin is sort of the, the birthplace of, uh, of all the major mammal types. Uh, I didn't mention whales. Um, whales, believe it or not, evolved from land living creatures related to camels. And we even had stuff like here at that in the, in the Willwood, in the Eocene, the early Eocene uh, of the Cenozoic.